Welcome to the Non-Obvious Insights Show. I'm your host, Rohit Bhargava, and every week I go through hundreds of news sources to curate the most interesting and underappreciated stories that you might have missed. This week, we'll be talking about the downsides of hustle culture, the myth of food shortage, Coca-Cola coffee, secrets you'll learn from working on private jets, the future of virtual event dress codes, and the rise of virtual beings. All that and another selection of the non-obvious book release of the week are coming in just a few seconds. We are live streaming to Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope, and the show starts right now. Happy Thursday, Non-Obvious Nation. We're back for another edition of the most interesting stories of the week. And I got to say, the thing that's been on my mind this week, and I've been thankful for it actually, is that our kids are not starting school yet. In fact, we're weeks away from that. But I've been reading all of these stories about kids going to school and and uh, and one in particular about uh, kids being crowded. And there was like this visual from a story uh, this week about kids being, being crowded in school. And I was just thinking to myself, uh, a, I'm glad we're not dealing with that right now. Uh, and B, sometimes it's kind of nice not to be first. You know, I mean, sometimes we talk a lot about like the benefits of being first and how awesome it is to be first. And now that I see other schools opening and dealing with some of the things that are happening, at least in the U.S., when it comes to schools opening, like it's kind of nice not to be not to be first. And so that was my first thought uh, as I was reading this story uh, about kind of all of the schools. Um that was one of the things, and as you know, every week I talk about the most interesting stories of the week and uh, and the non-obvious stories, and, and I share them in my weekly email. Um, that was the first one. That actually didn't make it into my email, but uh, it was one of the stories that that I talked about. And, and the other lead story, actually, that was from the email was one that I got a lot of emails about from many of you who read the email this morning and responded because it really resonated for you. And it was a story from Vanity Fair talking about Ellen Pompeo, who plays Meredith Grey in the TV show Grey's Anatomy. Um, and she was just talking about how she's been the long-standing cast member in that show. And despite all the temptations to kind of leave the show, go and do something else, I mean, this show's been running for, I don't know, almost two decades. It's been a long, long-running show. She just talked about how it was nice to not have to hustle. Like it was nice to just have the show, have it be steady, get the steady paycheck, be able to focus on her family and, and just have this regular steady thing, which in the world of acting and entertainment, like that's not that common. And as I was reading that, I was sort of thinking to myself, you know, we spend so much time talking about like hustle culture and how great it is to always be chasing the next thing and always be hungry and and actors in particular are, are always looking for that performance of a lifetime you know the one that's going to get them the the oscar or the or the victory or whatever it is and here's an actor who's saying you know i've got a i've got a great role i like it i'm making awesome money doing it why would i move why would i leave <laughs> and it reminded me that I talk a lot about entrepreneurship and I've become an entrepreneur in my life pretty much when I turned 40, like about five years ago. And before that, I really wasn't an entrepreneur. I wasn't the kid. I wasn't like my kids who are just going and trying to sell stuff because they're just being entrepreneurial. Like that wasn't me. And a big piece of my story is that I found entrepreneurship later, but it wasn't like I was unhappy for my whole life because I didn't know that I was an entrepreneur. I actually had a great time. I was working at a big company. I was doing work that I enjoyed. I learned a lot from it. I wouldn't change that entire background. I wouldn't go back and say, man, I wish I was an entrepreneur when I was 14. That's not my story. I liked what I did when I did it, and I like what I'm doing now when I'm doing it now. And this story just kind of reminded me that, look, we need to stop putting this on each other and, and maybe on ourselves too, that we've always got to be hustling, that we've always got to be seeking that next best thing. Uh, and instead, like maybe just enjoy what we've got right now, like especially now because so many things have been changing and, and the world has been shifting and, and many people have lost their jobs or lost their livelihoods. And if you're doing something that you like and you're, or you're actually making a decent living doing it, like just take a moment and, and be happy for that. And that's what this story really awakened for me, this idea that like we have to remember that sometimes and we, and we don't. And that's a problem. I think for many of us, because it just makes us less happy than we could be. And, and why be less happy? Like, just be thankful for what you have. 
Another story this week that resonated for me, and this was kind of because, partially because I've been a Clear member for a long time, and Clear is the uh, service for many of my international listeners. You you don't have it in, in your country. You may have an alternative version of it, but essentially it's like a speed through the the checkout, um, speed through the airport security uh, version of, of a tool. And you pay a membership fee, and then you're pre-screened, and then you can make it through the airports faster. Now, I haven't been to an airport in like, three, four months, something like that, which is very unusual for me. I'm not planning on canceling this membership though, because I find it hugely useful and I've become a very loyal member when I do travel, but also I've just been watching their brand pivot. And right now, one of the things that they're looking at is taking their kiosks and using them for health screening. You, so you can imagine these kiosks that you've probably seen in an airport, if you've traveled through a US based airport, at least using those at sporting events or at restaurants, outside of restaurants or outside of schools even. I mean, the potential for this is is huge. And one of the things that they talked about is eventually when we have a vaccine for COVID-19, which hopefully will be sometime, right? We'll need to be able to catalog who's gotten the vaccine and who hasn't. And then we're going to need tools and technology like this as well. So I just thought like they were, they were pivoting really well for what's going to come and as a business person, I, I like to see that. I like to see that smart strategy because a lot of times we're just reacting to the thing that's happening right now. And I thought that that the way they were thinking about this and the way that they were anticipating what would come and smartly changing their business model a little bit was a very, very smart thing to do. So that story really stuck out for me. Another story this week that focused on a myth that I think a lot of times we hear about is that we don't have enough food, that there's going to be this dramatic food shortage because population is increasing and we're not going to be able to feed everybody. And the truth is we actually do have enough food. Like humans grow enough food to feed every human on the planet. And there's plenty of data that shows that. The problem is that the food doesn't always make it to the people who need it most. And sometimes it's too expensive or it's uh, it's not moved efficiently before some of it spoils. And this story from NPR, and they've done multiple stories kind of over the last several months and probably even further than that, if you if you dig, about this topic. But this story raised a different question. And, and what was interesting for me was it was this example of, of uh, problem shifting, what I call problem shifting. And this is the, the idea that when we're focused on one problem, it blinds us to solving for what might be a better problem to be considering. So if we're always trying to figure out like, man, we don't have enough food, we need to grow more food, the problem you start solving is more food, more production. But it doesn't solve that other problem of getting the food to the people who need it. So instead of focusing on making more food, what if we focused on making it more efficient to get the food to different places and make it less environmentally impactful to make that food? Because one of the challenges of farming in particular is there's a big environmental footprint. It uses lots of water. It creates lots of emissions. I mean, all of these environmental challenges are part of the food that we grow. And last week I talked about a story of methane, reduced methane cows, which was kind of a funny version of that, where you, if you feed the cows lemongrass, apparently they fart 30% less, which is good. I mean, that's part of the solution. And like, who doesn't want less farty cows, right? That's probably good for everybody. Uh, but the idea here is like, let's change the problem that we're trying to solve. Let's rethink it. And maybe that'll be beneficial. Like maybe that'll actually be really good. So that story was, was just an interesting example of that. Another more lighthearted one, and this really struck home for me because uh, I spent four years going to a university that is affectionately called Coca-Cola University because of how much funding Emory gets from Coke. So this has been a part of my background, like uh, having Coke. And I know perhaps more people than most uh, who swear by having a can of Coke for breakfast, or at least as part of their breakfast, which is a really odd thing to do and, and perhaps distinctly American to do that. I don't know. Some of you international uh, folks listening, maybe you can comment on whether anybody outside of America would do something like that. But what was interesting for me about this is Coke launched coffee. And the coffee, the can of coffee has twice the caffeine as Coke. And it seemed like an interesting thing to, to trial uh, and to do. I mean, coffee drinkers are vast in, in the world and trying to move away from just the sugary beverages that Coke has been known for is obviously a smart thing because people are generally drinking less of those and they know that it's not that healthy for them. So this was just like that new category. And I started thinking, and I kind of joked about it in the email that, 
look, if they're going to be infusing Coke and, and doing crossover things, I mean, what about this whole cannabis market, right? Like where's, where's my, uh, coca coca cannabis right the thing that that infuses that like wouldn't you want to experiment with that too so like they're going to be trying lots of different stuff i think and this was just one of those examples so it was uh, it was fun it was a little bit lighthearted, uh interesting another story that that i was paying attention to this week was netflix's announcement i um, mean you may have seen this that you can now watch shows on twice speed or one and a half times speed, which means you can essentially watch these shows sped up on various devices. Right now, it's not rolled out for your TV yet. It's just on mobile devices or tablets. But this has been a really, really controversial thing for Netflix for a long time because all of the creators, the filmmakers, the studios, they don't want you to be able to watch the stuff on twice speed because from an artistic point of view, like they made it the speed that it should be, right? They don't want you to speed it up. And I was really conflicted, I got to say, about this story because uh, I'm a creator. I don't make films, uh, but I'm a creator and I'm a writer. And I know that when I write a book and I obsess over it and I spend, you know, 14 or 16 rounds of editing to try and get every word to be as good as it could possibly be, I still know that when you, you buy the book, many of you are not going to read it cover to cover. It's a business book. And a lot of you are just going to skim it and not maybe not even read it at all. And that used to bother me. Because I used to think, man, I spent all this time and like, why can't you just spend the time? Like, you don't have to read every book, but at least read my book, you know? Uh, but then I thought about it further and I'm like, you know, even if somebody takes one of my books, opens it for five minutes and gets an idea in those five minutes that changes their career or changes what they do or changes how they think, like, that's totally worth it. I mean, sure, you didn't read the whole book, but you got huge value out of it, even just by spending five minutes on it. And to me, like that became enough. Like, I'm good with that. Like, uh, if that's what you get from the book, perfect. If you read the book all the way through, great. Also, it's not up to me to dictate how you use this book that I spent so much time creating. And that perspective is not widely held in the world of Hollywood and films. And so they probably hate that I'm making that comparison, anybody who's working in that, in those industries. But to me, I kind of understood that like, look, we want to give the consumers the control. And, and at the end of the day, I think what will end up happening is what's kind of happened with the slow food movement, right? We can eat faster and we can have quick food and we can kind of eat while on the go and, and have the burrito in our hand while we're walking down the street. But there's an entire movement that says, sometimes you just want to savor the meal. You want to enjoy it. You want to take your time. And I think there will be, if we start to see this become more commonplace, that we can speed up stuff and watch it faster, some stuff we'll want to watch faster. Because, like, who wants to watch American Idol at regular speed? Like, it's just, it takes too long, right? It it's boring um, eventually because you get used to the faster version. But other things you may say, look, I love this experience. I want to take the time that it's supposed to take. And by the way, you can actually slow stuff down, too. Uh, that was interesting about this. The other last point that I want to make on this, which I had not considered, but is a great potential for this, is when Netflix offered this for people who uh, are blind, what they've found is when you're blind, you actually, from an auditory point of view, you can understand stuff faster. And so it's much better for people who aren't watching the experience anyway, because they can listen to it faster and they can comprehend faster because they've trained themselves to do that. And I just thought that was a nice feature for people who have a disability who could experience the content much faster and much more in, in an interesting way. So as uh, you know, many of you know, uh, I write a weekly email every week. Uh, many of the stories that you're listening to here are from that weekly email. And what you'll find if you subscribe here is every Thursday morning, you'll get an edition of that email uh, coming into your inbox and you will be able to read the stories, read the most interesting stories every week. So I hope you do subscribe to that. I hope you join me there. Thank you so much for being part of this virtual show and let's keep rolling. Uh, and the next story that I wanted to share with you is our non-obvious double take story of the week, which is a feature that I've been trying out, playing with. It's all experiments, right? And I've been playing with this idea of the story that made me think twice about something that I maybe had a different perspective on going in. And one of the things that, that I know and have written about in the past is just the stigma attached to people who choose, especially women, who choose not to have kids. Uh, where society sort of says, well, you must be unfulfilled if you don't have children. Like that's the natural need for everybody, right? To, to procreate and to have kids. And one of the effects, and this was an interesting story from the Atlantic, one of the effects of the pandemic may be that now 
we're having more acceptance for people who don't, who choose not to have kids, uh, who are, who have waited because their choice actually looks pretty smart right now. I mean, especially if you happen to be stuck at home with young kids, uh, you're definitely thinking back to the time when you didn't have kids and, and, uh, reminiscing perhaps uh, about it. Maybe that's the wrong word. It's insensitive to say, but look, the story is the story. And that really made me think twice about questioning some of these long held assumptions we have about culture. And one of them being everybody should have kids. Uh, and maybe that's not really the case or not what we should think about. So anyway, uh, that story got me thinking. Another story from this week that I thought was very interesting was about a feature from Google, which they've actually had for some time, but has found new relevance right now, I think, which is spotlighting stores that are owned by minorities, uh, that are women-led, that are Black-owned in the listings, in the search listings. So now when you're searching for stores near me that sell whatever, if you're searching for a bike store or an ice cream shop or whatever... Google will now tell you about the ownership of that store so you can choose to spend your money in certain places that are that are led by uh, different types of people. And I thought this was a really, really great feature to add and, and perfect for Google because we're already using Google to find so many of these things. So why wouldn't they uh, do something like this? And I just thought it was just a beautiful piece of empathy and also a beautiful feature to launch. And so if you haven't seen it, I just wanted to spotlight it for you because I know many of us are, are really trying to change the way that we spend our money. And, and that is a piece of how we kind of put out what we believe in the world, how we choose to spend our money. And this was a great example of, of just doing that in a, in a nice way. Another story this week that captured, piqued my interest, piqued my curiosity, I have to say, was a story from Business Week magazine that was actually titled Eight Secrets You Can Learn from Working on Private Jets. And it was authored by somebody who had been working as a as an airline attendant um, on some of these private jets. And, and some of the stuff was things that you would expect, like people spending their money really poorly or, or how much wastage there is because they just have so much food uh, to cater to every possible thing that that person could possibly want on the flight. But the one tip, the one secret, that stood out for me in this story was that the biggest divas in this super rich culture of people who are using private jets weren't the celebrities. They weren't the ultra rich people. It was the PAs of those people, the professional assistants, personal assistants or professional assistants. I'm not exactly sure what the P stands for. Maybe I should, uh, maybe somebody can, just, <laughs> can tell me, but either way, uh, that I found fascinating because it's these people who are choosing on behalf of the celebrities. They're choosing on behalf of these really rich people. And what they would find over and over again is these, these uh, PAs would be super specific about what's required. The flight has to have exactly this many magazines. It has to have the blue M&Ms. There has to be a gluten-free meal. And then the person, the celebrity, the VIP gets on the plane and all they want is a burger. And they don't look at any of that stuff. And uh, to me, it was just this reminder that the more direct relationships we have, the less gatekeepers we have to those things, the more we can control our own reputation and the less wastage we'll have too. Uh, and it just struck me how much wastage was built into this system of the private jets simply because there was someone who was trying to cover all their bases and just not get yelled at in case the person they worked for wanted something. And so this just in case stuff led to lots and lots of wastage because food on a private jet, especially when you're going back and forth to different places, you can't just take the food and then give it somewhere else. Like after the flight, I didn't know this, but like after the flight, that food has to be basically incinerated. Like it's not allowed to go and cross borders and stuff like that. So it's a lot of wastage. And that was kind of a story that stuck out for me in this one. Another one that uh, captured my attention, I think because I'm a soccer player, but uh, it also was kind of a sign of the times is that soccer players can now get a red card in many matches if, according to a referee's judgment, they were intentionally coughing on someone. It's considered the same type of offense as if you used abusive language or you spit on a fellow player or anything like that. Now, intentional coughing is has been added to that list which was just such a such a covid specific thing that i thought it was interesting i don't have a deep insight there but i just thought that was interesting and so i wanted to share it another story that i was watching and reading about this week was there was an event called i believe it was the virtual being summit and there's an article in wired about the summit and what it talks about is just 
what it would be like and what it is like to live in a world where there are more virtual people who are having their own personalities like little Michaela or like some of these other virtual avatars that are not like, it's not like a virtual version of me. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about like a virtual person who has a following, uh, who has people paying attention to them, who has fans and what it means to be human in a world where there's more virtual beings like that. And it's not, I don't think that the article really poses a conclusion to that. It just, investigates more deeply this this situation that we're living in and, and the fact that there's more and more of this happening and it's going to be something that that continues to to happen more and more and and to me it's just something that i'm watching con continually and i think there's some great content now coming out of that summit that definitely if that's an interest area for you like go google that check it out uh and, and just watch some of that stuff i think it'll be beneficial Another announcement that, that came out this week for the Emmys, which are happening in September, is the dress code. Uh, there was a letter released to all of the attendees, all the celebrities who attend the Emmys. And in the letter, it talked about the dress code. And uh, it said, basically, the dress code was, come as you are, but there was a second part of that. And the second part was, come as you are, but make an effort. And I just thought that was like such a nice way to talk about a dress code for literally anything because you know we're staying at home uh, i do these shows and i don't get dressed up. i mean i'm just wearing a t-shirt but like i'm making an effort you know i took a shower i shaved today so you might notice the beard's gone uh it's sort of like an in and out thing for me <laughs> um when i can't take it anymore and it just gets too hot then the beard gets shaved and then it grows back pretty quickly so it's uh, i go back and forth right but what i liked about this dress code is it's like be yourself and I kind of wish that was like the dress code for life, right? I mean, I don't wear ties. I hate ties. Uh, and I've been been very vocal about that. I almost got fired from one of my jobs because I would continually wear jeans and, and uh, they would continually tell me, look, you can't wear jeans. And I said, but my jeans are the most expensive thing I own. Like uh, if you want me to wear uh, $15 khakis, then I could do that. Or I could wear these beautiful, nice jeans that I have that are actually fashionable. And they said, well, wear the, wear the ugly ones. And I'm like, that's not the answer I'm looking for. Uh, so I would get really frustrated by that. I get frustrated by dress codes in general. I just think that uh, if we can look decent, I mean, I don't think people should just wear anything and, and make no effort at all, but come as you are, make an effort. Like, let's use that as a dress code. Like, definitely, if you can, if you're in charge of a dress code, if you're in like HR or you're leading your company, like take the dress code from the Emmys and steal it, like use it. I mean, that that is a great idea to do. I, I definitely recommend that. The final story that I wanted to share this week is the book release of the week. And every week I find a new book that is just released that particular week. And so this week, uh, one of the books that just came out is a book called Make Change by um, a guy named Sean King, who is a leader of the Black Lives Matter. Uh, movement and someone who has been really in the space for a long, long time. And, and what I'll say about this book that I found really interesting and, and why I recommend you pick it up is yes, I mean, it's very topical and it's a story and a, a topic that I think is worth sharing and worth talking about. But the way this book is written in terms of the narrative of it and how he takes you into his moment of, I think at one point he says, we've, we're going through a collective uh, PTSD. And the way he frames it and talks about coming out of it, I just thought was a, a really nicely done. It's not uh, it's not an angry book. Uh, it's not a preachy book. Uh, to me, I just found it very authentic, down to earth, exactly the type of book that, that if you're going to dig into something uh, on the topic of Black Lives Matter or equality or diversity or any of the, the sort of buzzwords that are being used out in the, in the media, uh, this is a great one to to use that for because I, I just think it was uh, well done. So anyway, this book came out this week. It's brand new. And every week I'll feature a new book release of the week. As many of you know, we also do our non-obvious book awards, uh, which is the compilation of the entire year's worth of books. And we find the most interesting business or nonfiction books. So that's the kind of lane for it. And we spotlight them and release that whole list in December. So if you happen to know a great book 
and you want to suggest it, definitely send me an email. We'll add it to our list of books to consider. And then we go out to all the PR people and people in the industry and request all of these books sometimes, or they get sent to us and there's a way to enter. So you can just go to nonobvious.com slash book awards if you happen to be an author and you want to enter your book or if you want to suggest something. So we're always looking for great books. I like to share new ones every week and that's our book release of the week. So that is the show. It had a lot of stories, but I got to say it's a little bit, it went a little bit faster today. I, I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, but I think that's a good thing. Uh, if we were in a meeting and we'd booked half an hour together, I would say that I'm giving you a gift of about five minutes back. But since we didn't book a meeting and the show is as long as it needs to be, this is about all we've got. So thank you for joining me for the Non-Obvious Insights show today. Uh, next week, it will be a special edition, not in this location. So it will be, again, remote. So we'll be taking the show on the road, so to speak, uh, locally. And so I'll enjoy setting that up and having a slightly different background. I won't have all my cool branded stuff, but that's okay. We'll be, we'll be all right. Uh, so thanks for joining me. Thanks for being part of the non-obvious insights show. And remember always, always stay non-obvious. <laughs>